Can everybody hear me? This sounds good, sounds good. I'm getting a lot of nods. All right, this is perfect. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to thank 4C uh, for kind of, you know, having this event and uh, asking me to uh, be a speaker here. Uh, Prague is beautiful. If you're from Prague, good job on that. Um, my name, as you can see above me, is Ian Lang. I'm a senior animator for Blizzard on the WoW team. Uh, today I'm going to give a little insight to how we work uh, on the World of Warcraft team and talk about a profession that we don't usually uh, think of uh, in terms of animation, but I think has a lot of insights that can help animators in general create some really interesting poses. So since this is an animation talk, this is my obligatory old nine men, or nine old men alert. Um, as, anyone might tell, as any one of them might tell you, animation is not just about movement, right? Uh, if all you're worried about is just having a character move on screen, then you've really only found part of the solution. Unique and dynamic poses help to drive a great animation. Just like a great story with no great characters will always fall flat, animation is the same way. Now, when learning animation, there's an astounding amount of good educational material out there, but sometimes I think it's good to look at it from a different perspective, and you gain a lot of insights that you may not have ever noticed before. And so today I'd like to start with something that has always fascinated me and something that I think can really offer a lot of insights into creating those shapes and poses. And that is advertising, and more specifically, graphic design. So let me just say here and now, I really love advertising, you know, and I find it really fascinating. The goal of advertising is to create an immediate impact on the customer's experience by fabricating a moment so dramatically that you can't help but be pulled in, right? And though we're, we're as animators are not selling sodas or indoor grills or anything of the sort, we are selling something. We're selling an idea. You know, whether it's an action like a sit, a run, a jump, a reload, or some sort of an emote like a talk, a point, a yes or a no, or a question. And your job as an animator is to speak to the player. And you have to do that quickly and decisively, just like in advertising, something that, the, that they've been doing oh, for decades now. And so why are they successful? Because when you're driving down the street or walking down the road, they need to stand out out of all this visual white noise of all the billboards, right? And they do this through clean, unique images that suck the player in. Something that triggers their mind to kind of, uh, triggers our mind to kind of squirrel out and go, oh, notice that, notice that. And I'm sure most of us probably see this McDonald's logos over here, right? It's not even the biggest logo on screen, but it differentiates itself because everything is rectangle, it's rectangle, rectangle, and then you've got this nice golden arch silhouetted by, uh, or struck by red. And when, similarly, when players are in the heat of battle and all these effects and explosions are usually happening around them, we need to be able to catch the, their attention by telling them what they're doing. So we need to shortcut those ideas and messages to the player's brain as quickly as possible. So how best to achieve that? So these are two of the most recognizable images around, right? Even a child could look at these and recognize exactly what they stand for, a woman and a man. Now, graphic designers have an idea called inherent logic. Meaning, when you take a look at a logo, you should inherently understand what it, what it stands for. Which is a really boring name, by the way, for an industry that prides itself on being pretty creative. So you have to understand what's its purpose. Can you understand what the message is trying to be conveyed? Does it have sharp angles? Maybe the sign is trying to warn us. You know, perhaps it's a little bit aggressive or chaotic. You know, what if they use rounded or softer shapes? Are they trying to calm us or relax us? Create a trusting environment? Now, they utilize these primal responses of rounded and sharp angles and then work that into a more complicated message of purpose and intent. So what about these poses here? Now, these are some of our caster readies from WoW. And right away, you can, right from the very beginning, you can tell what they stand for. There's a story to it. There's an identity that the player can instinctively pick up. And without being told, we can assume a number of things about them. These poses here utilize as many rounded shapes as possible. They give us a calming, almost protective tone. And you might right, rightly guess that these casters offer shields or heels or some protective nature. Now others would appear more squat and angular, and this gives a, this impression of a raw or sort of hunting state. And these are the messages we try to, play, uh, to tell the player. And we distill these ideas into basic shapes that speak to us on a primal level, re reinforcing their personalities. Now, I'm sure you all remember, did anybody have like life drawing classes when you were in school or something? And in the very beginning, they just help you, they tell you to do those basic shapes. Or if you've ever seen Glenn Vilpu do his drawings, that's how he starts off, these basic shapes, and then kind of reinforces uh, more complicated shapes as he goes on. And this same idea follows here. 
So as you begin to create this graphical nature to your own work, it becomes one of the many anchor points for the game as a whole. It shares the stage with character art, design, environment, and sound. And as you develop and refine the style of your posing and animation, you begin to create an identity, one of the many things that, uh, for people, it helps to recognize your game. Can you guys hear that when I drink? That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> so how do we create this inherent logic, right? So let me show you with some images that hopefully you'll recognize, because if you don't, that's going to be a really interesting part of the talk. So can anyone tell me what this is besides the obvious black circle? Nothing? You guys are quiet today, huh? Dots, Dots yeah. All right, all right, all right. We got a lot of you know, options there. It doesn't really look like much, right? Maybe it's a moon, you know, dot, uh, a holeless donut, whatever those are called. Uh, maybe it's a top-down view of a sombrero hat. We really have no idea, right? It could be any number of things, but in its current state, it doesn't really tell us much. So let's change this idea up a little bit. Let's add a little bit of negative space and see if we can make it a bit more recognizable. What about now? Ah, there we go. I was hoping you were going to say that, by the way. Um, as you can see, even taking away all the texture and the color and leaving you with just the silhouette, a vast majority of you recognize what this was, a Pokeball. Now, the silhouette becomes an anchor point for Pokemon as a whole. This is an example of a shape that had no meaning before Pokemon, but whose identity is now almost impossible to separate. And what does that shape itself tell us, if you didn't know this was actually Pokemon? All these rounded features tell us it's approachable, it's something friendly, something we might want to be a part of. So what about this one? Death Star, exactly. See, the instant you see this image, you know exactly what it is. The angularity of it cautions us, right? Over on the, on the right here. It conjures up a feeling of dread. Unique and digestible images allow a message to be conveyed to the player in a timely manner. And so essentially, these two images are built from the same basic shape, a circle. But it's the use of strong negative space that helps us out. It becomes just as important as the shape we're making. To sort of use an ill-fitted quote for this example uh, from the musician Miles Davis, it's, the notes you play. it's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. So let's try these same principles with a character. Iron Giant, right? So at first it might seem a little bit difficult to find much of a change in a robotic design such as the Iron Giant. But what do we start to recognize about these two, shape, these two images? They evoke two very different emotions, don't they? And even if you don't know what this character is, you'd recognize some, very t some key things about them. The first image has a friendly quality to it, even though instinctually you look at it and you're like, this guy's about to throw a car. They utilize rounded shapes not only in the body itself, but also in the negative space around it, in the arm and even in that shoulder, I, th I find it's very interesting. It sends off no warnings, no alarms. The ability to introduce this even in the robotic areas introduces that at this moment, he's kind, he's lovable, he's a friend, even though he's a little slow at times. While this one is obviously meant to kill, right? Even barring the gun, that's a very obvious uh, tell, right? Here they begin to introduce a lot more lines and a lot more sharp angles. And if you look closely, the eyes and the mouth are actually uh, utilizing angles as well. The eyes became this really jagged polygon, and the teeth had this angularity to them as well. Animators are after the same thing character artists are after, right? They want contrast, they want scale, volume, angularity, or the lack thereof. Now, I think comics and anime really fulfill these design principles well. They focus on designing a pose that helps to pull the audience in. And because we react on a primal level to sharp and soft angles, when we create our poses, they also need to have purpose. Sharp or soft points that don't mean much without a message. We need to uh, look behind me and see if you can actually tell what this character is. You could probably, probably figure this one out. It's not too bad. Some of you might have guessed this is Spider-Man. But a harder question is probably, what is he doing, right? Is he falling? He's dancing? Is that what I heard? Oh, I like that. That's good. He might be. That's actually not a bad move. <laughs> Jumping, OK. I've heard climbing a wall sometimes. You know, whatever it is, it really lacks a sense of weight, of purpose, and emotion. And just like the, the, the black circle from before, we're kind of all left unclear, right? So let me actually show you what Spider-Man is up to. There, yeah, right? He's getting hit by some ray or something. This is a, an example of graphic design concepts of purpose, shape, contrast, angularity not coming into play. It fails that inherent logic test. But what about this one? And I think this was actually from the game that just came out here recently, so good job on that. 
Uh, look at the expression, right? It's got that, that classic high legs up, you know, the outstretched hand. It has everything. These poses help to solidify the character as much as the logo on his chest does. So good pose design helps us lock in a strong narrative quickly. They support each other, right? Bad design makes that connection a struggle. You know, it, it can be overcome, but you know, why make it harder on the player? Now here's one of my favorite examples of just wonderful posing. I saw this years ago and I, I thought of it while I was doing this talk. Just look how expressive it is, right? Now I would wager it took fractions of a second to understand what was happening. And you're not thinking, oh, Hulk is jumping. There's a story behind it. You're thinking, holy shit, this guy's about to destroy a whole city block, right? Now, even though what I've been showing you are static images, they tell us something important, that we can build in a lot of information into a single pose. But since we're animators, we have to do that concept and reinforce it over however many frames long the animation is, the motion. We're looking for the same principles, though, one of space, of contrast, of shape. We need to layer that over and over until the motion itself maintains that same graphic style as well. We don't want to have sharp poses that then get muddied down due to soft and mistimed animation. Oh, well, I agree. <laughs> uh, there are a number of games that do this really well, uh, but one of my favorite examples is actually Dark Souls. Can everybody see that is a little bit dark, so hopefully you can. Now, I wager all of you kind of have uh, this, this memory of what Dark Souls is, right? It's a very recognizable style. And it's that way because everything, from the boss models to the layout of the zone to the building design, all reinforce that specific design philosophy, and it carries through to the animation. This game is it's beautiful, right? It's rich, with everything in it feeling like it's been molded with purpose. And the way this boss even holds himself kind of sells the state he's in, right? He's on his knees, and he's sort of like decaying almost. And that's why it's so successful. Everything matters. And everyone who's played this can conjure up that distinct imprint that the game leaves you with. And it's not a desire to kind of curl up in the fetal position because you've died a billion times. But it's that, that consistent vision across the, whole, across the board, across the whole game. And the style is so easy to recall in your minds because it's so unique and so well constructed. So let's look at one of our, the other animators on our team. Uh, look at some of these design principles in action. This is Kevin Rucker, uh, one of the other animators on, on World of Warcraft. And as you can see, the model itself is busy as hell, right? Just arms and tentacles and everything that the character artist could think of. But notice how he's careful to ensure we get good spacing between all these parts. It allows our minds to easily digest where everything is. And even with all of that going on, our brains don't have to work hard to decipher what's going, what's what and what goes where, right? The negative space gives our brains a shortcut to that information. So how do we carry these ideas into our own pipeline? <laughs> uh, look at these images here. You know, they represent a different class in our game, either a priest, a warrior, a hunter, shaman, and all the rest. Every class needs their own identity, just like they receive different armor sets, a different spell build, or a different quest line. The monk and the demon hunters are a great example of that. Right? They're the most recent classes added to the game, and they were able to receive their own unique animation treatment. And we realized we wanted to carry that through to our older classes as well. Remember the bathroom signs, the male and female symbols, how distinct they were from each other, recognizable from afar? Our classes should feel that same way, right? The principles of space, of purpose, of uniqueness, of primal responses to soft and sharp angles. These will help guide us in developing our class looks. Now, when WoW was first released back in 2004, there were a lot of limitations to what the, time, uh, what the team could do. There were time constraints, rig constraints, engine constraints, and most likely many that I'm just not aware of. Uh, the team did a really impressive job for what they had at the time, but with the current standards of what we could do with the game and where we wanted the game to go, we really needed to bring some of these animations up. And since rebuilding all of the animations would probably move our schedule to Christmas of 3038, we determined during our Legion production schedule that we wanted to start revamping and modernizing our melee animations first, as this gave us a little bit more initial mileage. We did eventually get into the caster and uh, range, uh, which you'll probably see just a little bit later. So here's a great example of what I mean. Now, as you can see, the impact after Legion is launched is quite noticeable. It takes into account heavy weighting, good lines, nice arcs, sharp posing. And there were also a few rules we tried to obey. Every new attack must start in an anticipation pose. The hit frame should be between four to eight frames of the animation. 
The hit frame is specific for at least for our game. Uh, when a player hits the spell, we really wanted them, to, wanted them to maintain that ownership. You know, if there's too much of a delay, too much of an anticipation into the attack itself, it sort of divorces them from that uh, that that action. And it's also why we want to start in an antic, right? We want to have less of a wind up, so, which is the in uh, the legion image right there. We actually start in an antic. Uh, we also need to have a follow through that should be a pose that's indicative to the animation itself. And then a return, which should be generalized because it might work with a number of different readies. So today I'm going to walk you through one of those animations that we did, which is the rogue pierce attack, the new rogue pierce attack. Now before we begin to animate, we of course need to define what that class is, right? And in that way, helping to drive the motions forward. It's a pretty rudimentary exercise, but it helps to kind of narrow down my th thought process, which is just to give adjectives to it, right? Just to kind of help narrow my, my thinking. Uh, after that, I start to back that up with video and you know, reference either done by myself or found on the internet, which is usually a black hole because you find stuff that you just don't need. All right, so what are some adjectives we could kind of use, right? We've got shadow stalking, we've got backstabbing, assassin, knife wielding, nimble. These are important reminders because as you can see, none of these would work for something like a paladin or a death knight. And now that we have our adjectives to help guide our process, we begin the posing process, blocking out ideas we want to move forward with. And as I start to shift, I, mean, I wish I was this fast, by the way. This is sped up, but I wish I was this quick in animating. Um, and as, as I start to kind of shift and manipulate it around, I start to lock in on some ideas. And at this point, remember, we just want the essence. We just want the essence of what that pose is going to be. One pose that tells us what the, hit, the attack frame is going to be. And so when I start to lock in on some ideas, here's where I begin to kind of reinforce that with images or videos. And I just want to look for some major points, right? How far is the chest torqued? You know, the line of the hip through to the foot, or maybe spacing under the arm in relation to the chest itself. And after a while, I'm starting to develop some nice poses. You know, some are obviously stronger than others, but it's just a brainstorming session, just a blue sky session. We're not concerned about good or bad ideas at this point. We can worry about the quality of them later on. We just want to get the ideas on paper, quote unquote. So once I have a few unique poses, uh, you know, I get some feedback on it. And this is important for two main reasons, right? It helps to maintain consistency, and it gets a fresh eye on your own animation. Every animator has had a pose you know, that they've been super into, just like, yes, this one is it. This is going to get me the next big, next big scene. Uh, but it turns out that it just doesn't work, right? It just doesn't read in the way that you thought it would. So my, my lead's an old traditional animator, so he's very keen on lines and shapes. You know, we're looking for S shapes kind of arcing through the body. We want nice A shapes in the negative space in the legs. Nice, ensuring that clean, powerful silhouette. And it's here that we notice a problem. Now everyone take a few seconds to look at these poses. I'm sure you probably already have. And see if you can spot the issue. And it's not the hands. Well, this is a bit of a, a, an engine thing we have to work with at times. So ignore the hand itself. But look at the, the uh, general pose and uh, see if you can figure out what it might be. All right, let's put it through a small animation that might help it. Does that help any? Are you, can you spot it? As you can see, the poses look pretty nice and expressive from the side. The profile here, we can kind of tell, except for that last one. I really don't like that last one. But from the side, we can kind of tell what everything is, is hap what's happening. But the profile is our second priority. Our first priority is to the player. And what we have here is essentially a box. There's nothing very expressive about it at all. We need a clear visual explaining to the player what this is, what they're doing. And this player view obviously falls at that, or fails at that. Uh, and this is why I, I personally love silhouette mode. I have this as a hotkey. I just go into silhouette, silhouette mode all the time. It strips all that detail away that lets our brain kind of fill in the gaps of what something might be. And that way, it, it allows our brain to kind of recognize, oh, is this pose working instinctively, or is it not, right? Intuitive logic. So we need to solve the issue of that narrow silhouette. So we begin to kind of break the arm out of that volume. You know, it does require a bit of a stance change to kind of accommodate that action. But as you can see, it really just, it just doesn't work at all. You know, forcing the shape changes, the uh, changes and weakens the pose as a whole. The force being pushed off the foot abruptly stops at the shoulder, something you wouldn't see in a pierce attack. And the images on the right show this sort of sagging shape, almost like an anchor, which I think is pretty appropriate because it really just feels very heavy. And that kind of fails that nimble adjective we, we used earlier. They lack a quickness to them. And we need, so we, we do need a different approach. So at this point, we kind of hash out what we're going to do, some, some sort of change that we're going to do to it. 
And we decided to physically move the model outside of the, that, that expected volume of action, you know, that sort of immediate where the player is going to be. And for us, that's a bit, uh, a bit of a change in the context of our game because most of the attacks occur in the small volume, restricting most of the movement to the area. We try to stay within it to maintain some integrity to the engine as deviating too far might cause gameplay or design issues. You know, imagine being near a cliff and you do this and all of a sudden you're Wile E. Coyote off the cliff there. So doing so also offers a second benefit. Remember these two adjectives we used earlier? Nimble, backstabber? These are traditional rogue attributes. And these ideas should not only be more visually appealing, but it will also be more unique and characteristic to the class. This action makes him feel like he's sort of moving through the shadows to attack you. So that's a shadow stalker as well. So I kind of go back, hash out some new poses, really start to kind of round out. They're, they're rounding out pretty well. And as we can see, they respect our responsibility to the player first and then to the group. Right? We always want to make sure that the group is being uh, recognized. Shapes look good. Negative space looks good. Nice, strong action. And we're going to add a few breakdown poses to kind of show some block out potential. And this is something I like to do just so it makes sure that I'm not kind of trapping myself, which has happened on occasion. I'm like, oh, I have no idea how to get into that shape. And so yeah, it's not too bad. It's fun. So let's run with this. It's a big addition to the game, so it does require a lot of feedback to it. You know, and with such a big addition, you know, it, we really do need lots of sign-off. Uh, a number, if you've known anybody from film or if you've worked in film, it's a very similar process where you have what feels like seven directors in a room probably giving you contradicting notes, you know. Maybe some overlap, which is always nice. So you have to kind of re, you know, figure out a way to kind of make that all cohesive and make it work. You know, thankfully, not all of that requires, uh, not everything we do is going to require that much work, but in this one, it does. Round of notes goes well. Thank you. You were asking, I'm sure. Uh, but there is one major note that we get that needs to be adjusted. Yes, we hit the nimble note, but I may have hit that a little too hard. This kind of got a little bit of a Nego Montoya action to it which I love because, you know, who doesn't love Inigo Montoya, right? It's a little bit too flamboyant of a swashbuckler, you know, even with our swashbuckler spec. Uh, so we do have to kind of rein that back in. That's usually my first go is usually to make it something really fancy. Uh, so I go back, make those adjustments, kind of pull it back in, ground the, the, the animation as a whole. Uh, so after a round or two, we really begin to lock in that idea and really just begin to add more breakdowns to it, right? We're always reinforcing those shapes. Something I have to kind of remind myself is to not dampen the original uh, strong poses in order to, uh, when I'm starting to kind of define the arcs and inertia of the body. You know, sometimes it's really easy to trap yourself and sort of smooth things out when you're refining. So make sure you kind of keep that, that teeth into the animation. So one way we like to introduce, especially on a, on a quick motion, one way we like to re reintroduce some of that, that strength into it is through smears and breaks. You know, thankfully, this is one of the great benefits of working on WoW. That's one of the, the really fun aspects of it. Uh, now, I know in realistic games, this is something that you may want to shy away from. Uh, but in the style of uh, you know, Ra Mario, Rabbids, Jax, Overwatch, there's a lot of them. You can really kind of go crazy with this. So you know, whatever game you're working on, make sure it it's fits. Now, these sorts of distortions really allow us to kind of ratchet up the impact of, of emotion. And this is also why, if you if I have any tech artists or anyone who kind of works with tech artists a lot. This is why you shouldn't have limiting rigs. You know, I think the uh, the idea is to sometimes make a, a safe rig, that, so you lock off a lot of different attributes. But for animators, they really want to have that that option to to do anything you can ever want to. And if you lock it off, you really start to get this sort of stiff feeling to it. So um, the the plus side to it is after a few rounds of animators breaking the rigs, which is going to happen. Um, you really get a nice, robust rig to it. So our tech team really ensured that whatever we could do, we could do. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, here are some, some, some of the smear and break frames that we use in some of our animations. This is just a couple. And so why do we want to use smear frames, right? They allow our break, br breakdowns, which sometimes happen over a couple frames or a frame, they, um, they allow our breakdowns to be as impactful as the story poses themselves. So let me show you why. He-Man. To any of the older audience, this will be a, a nice uh, nostalgia trip. Why does this feel stiff and unresponsive, right? Uh, by the way, it took me forever to find He-Man actually doing any sort of action in the cartoon. He usually just stands there. It took me forever. I had to watch a lot of these. Um, besides the fact that it feels like it's probably a little bit rotoscoped, uh, it just doesn't feel very responsive. There's not an impact to it. But this, on the other hand, is great, right? You feel it. 
You can, you can feel those hits. You can feel those, those, those attacks. It's, a, it's, it's expressive. It's visceral. So let's take, it, uh, uh, take a look at some of the smear frame actions of our own rogue animation, kind of going back. Now, as you can see, you're going to get weird results if you sort of pause the frame, which do look odd when you kind of single them out. But when played at normal speed, the impact of those smears and breaks can really be felt. Right? An effects artist, I unfortunately can't remember the name, uh, once said, he would be doing his job right if you never knew he was there at all. Now, if you hold on to a smear frame too long, the player really starts to pick it out, and it starts to distort, starts to distort the animation. Right? It becomes a little bit off model. Now, obviously, you're probably going to be seeing this because I'm playing this over and over and over again. But now, you know, if you notice, too, the, uh, the chest is actually completely rotating over that one frame. So you know, when you're doing these sorts of smears and breaks, really, don't be afraid to go nuts with it. You know, it's always easier to kind of pull it back a little bit. So let's take a look at what we've learned, just with this rogue pierce, and apply it to a caster animation that we got to do. So this is the, uh, a new mage precast that we had. Um, and these are just a couple of the poses. I distilled it down a little bit. But these are a couple of the poses that I landed on. And the pose on the right is actually an idle pose that we're going to get into. So we have to do a precast and get into the sort of the spell, spell idle. And the one on the right, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the concept that was pitched was sort of this mage is kind of like ripping all the energy out, out of the air and kind of distilling it into sort of a form, right? And neither are too bad, these two poses on the left. Uh, but as I start to kind of block in, you know, just to try and make sure I'm not trapping myself, I recognize uh, a big problem uh, for the one on the left. How am I going to show this sort of ripping motion, this nice, you know, contrasted action, if, he's, if she's over on the right, and then she ends on the right. There's not really a place to go. Yeah, I guess you could do this, but that's going to feel really muted. It's going to feel really toned down. And so that's why I end up landing on the one on the left. This way, I can kind of rip across the body. I have a lot of contrast to go over. Uh, but before I do so, I'm going to have to kind of strengthen up the pose as a whole. I kind of uh, pull her down a little bit, contract the shape more, tighten everything around the torso. Again, we want that. It's supposed to feel like you're kind of ripping energy out of the air. And so here's the animation kind of fleshed out a little bit more. You can see it coursing through. So obviously we start on the left, rip, and this, I think the second and third uh, frames here, uh, I think it's only like two or three uh, frames uh, uh, in between. So you really have not only a contrast in movement, but you have a contrast in time, too. It really feels violent. And then, of course, we settle into the spell idol at the end. And since this is a precast, we get to do a little bit more storytelling. We don't, it doesn't have to be a sort of like, you know, hit your attack frame at this particular uh, frame. So it's a little bit nice to change of pace sometimes. And here we are, all polished out. And as you can see, we're kind of paying attention to clean silhouettes, taking advantage of those smears. We sort of really boom, distort that arm there. And it helps to give a contrast to the animation so it doesn't feel so linear. And it still tells the story of where that's all going. And since some effects make everything a lot cooler, here we have the mage using it in the game. Uh, and depending on what kind of game you use, depending on what kind of compression, obviously you may have to be a little bit more exaggerating in your, uh, in your animation uh, before you get it into game. So feel free to amp it up wherever you need to. So here are just a few samples of some of the new combat animations. By no means all, we've done a lot more of these, but they give a, a pretty good indication of where we've gone and where we're kind of going towards. So what have we learned? We're in the wrap-up stage, guys. Intuitive logic. Remember, your players shouldn't have to struggle to understand what they're seeing. Your message should be sharp. It should be clear, precise. It should quickly tell the player all that they need to know. Clean silhouettes are what help this process. With clear, clean silhouettes, you improve your message to the player. Watch for muddled shapes. And if you strip out all the texture and all the lighting, this is a really good test to do on your own, can you still understand what that pose is? Bring someone over. Can you understand what the pose is? Or can they understand what the pose is? Strong line of actions. Ensure the energy carries itself correctly through the body. It shouldn't have a weird sort of stunted uh, end. Quick hit frames. Obviously, this is going to be game dependent. If you look at the Dark Souls, Dark Souls had a lot of anticipation, but then the hit frame, uh, but then the action itself was very quick, right? So this is a little bit game dependent. But for us, uh, it gives a clear, sharp response time to the player, um, <clears throat> depending on, uh, again, depending on what kind of game you have. Smears and breaks. If you can get away with them, try to. 
When the breakdown of a large action occurs within a small uh, limited frame count, you really want to try and elicit this tool if possible. It's a classic technique, you know, this is long Looney Tunes, old Looney Tunes days, um, but it's still really a powerful tool uh, even to this day. Expressive story poses. Now these are your guideposts to your animation, right? So whether large or small, broad or subtle animations, without them, you animate sort of aimlessly. You drift. Use them to strengthen not only your work, but help to create your game's identity as a whole. And that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Peace out. Thank no, you, Yen. Oh, no, 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 no. Please stay here. Let's not make it that easy for him. So if anybody <laughs> has a question, please raise a hand. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a following question. As far as I understand, uh, you, uh, you almost didn't use any mocap. So if one is working on a more like realistic game that utilizing a lot of mocap, how would you apply your principles in that case? So I actually worked in mocap for a number of years, and that was one of my first game jobs, actually, because you know, most of gaming is motion capture, right? Um, but you still have to look at motion capture from a keyframe aesthetic, right? You, I think the, the sort of the trap a lot of times when you're in motion capture is, oh, it's moving. It was captured from a human, so obviously it's going to look good. But if, we, if you kind of do like a silhouette change, really like, so if some if character's just walking like this, you know, just walking straight, you might want to like open up the arms a little bit just to get a little bit of space in here. And again, it's so that visually when the player is playing it, they're going to see that, that delineation between the body and the arm, right? You want to have that contrast. So even though you maybe have uh, uh, maybe working with mocap as a base, you still want to make sure that everything is clean, uh, almost as if you were animating from scratch. So you really pay attention to your, your negative shapes. I, I know when I was doing motion capture, I would uh, do a lot of layers, and I would do a lot of like, pose adjustments to make something read a little clearer, or just to be just more, more interesting in general. Uh, it's a very similar process to lip syncing, right? When we animate from scratch lip syncing, we do it very differently than people actually talk. If you actually watch people talk, they don't really you know, articulate very well. You, might as, you could pretty much just do a ba 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 and it kind of works. Anime gets away with it, right? Um, but when we animate, we have those points. We make them a lot more clear. And it's the same process when, you, when you're working in the body. You want to make that a lot more clear. Put a layer on if you want to. Try out a shape. See how it works. See if it reads a little bit better. Uh, just more, vis like, again, visual clarity. Hopefully that answers the question, right? Oh, that wasn't me, but that, I'll take it. Anyone more? Oh, All oh right. there we go. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you lose a lot and being on the track of, of, of losses. Also I'll try and answer that question. Um, okay. Get in here, we'll do like a duo thing. You Let's might get that. angry. Uh, Good. Unless you're um, a weird type of personality, which we cannot get, I guess. But it's a segment. I'm sure it's a segment of uh, people that like beating. What was the first part? The um, but you know, I come from. Um, Okay, so the question was, shouldn't the concept artist be helping you find those poses? And the answer is yes. So concept artists do a really great job in sort of determining what the sort of the story of what this character is, right? They're going to help develop, you know, the kind of the aesthetic to it. And as animators, yeah, you are going to try and carry a lot of that through. But by no means should that just be left up to the, to the uh, concept artist. Concept artists get the really wonderful benefit of putting whatever the hell they want to on paper, right? They can do anything. But as animators, once you get into game, you do have limitations that you have to sort of work within. So you're going to have to shift that a little bit more. So it really should be a conversation, not a dictation if that makes sense. Um, you take what the concept artist has brought, given you, the character artist, whoever is making the decisions, um, and as you start to kind of really develop the style to it, say, okay, this is not working as well. Can we change this design? For this particular animation, it works a little bit better, or this particular character, it works better if we, we do this instead, right? So feel free to adjust it a little bit. But they definitely are sort of the, sort of the creators of that kind of initial uh, idea. 
right? But it, it shouldn't have by no means, it usually is not sort of a one and done kind of deal. You know, there are some things that get adjusted. There are some things that you're going to want to change. And as animators, you have a different viewpoint than a concept artist is going to give. And you have the ability to kind of help uh, really establish the story of that character or that creature. So make sure that you're, it's not just a one-way conversation. It should be both ways. You say, oh, this works better if we do this instead. You know, so let's change this up a little bit. So hopefully you should, it should be a give and take. So. But they definitely do sort of dictate, dictate the pacing of that. Any more? Then let's thank Jan yet again. And uh, if you have any more questions uh, after the presentation, you can track him down and ask more. I'll be somewhere. Thank you, guys.